April 19th and 26th. Memorable days in the Korea of the future. Days to rank with the 1919 Samuel independence movement. For the first time, unarmed students rose to overthrow a government that had become corrupt and undemocratic. These students came from the universities, colleges, high and middle schools of Korea. They fought solely for freedom and almost entirely without weapons. 200 of them died and more than 7,000 suffered wounds or injuries. This was a revolution by idealists who asked nothing specific for themselves, only a better country for all Koreans. The immediate causes were the illegalities in the election of March 15th and the brutality of the police in connection with elections. This then is the real story of these last two Tuesdays in April 1960. Two days consecrated by the students of Korea to a nation that hopes to be free and democratic for all time to come. It all began with peaceful demonstrations, with demands for a new election, the righting of old wrongs. There was at first little thought of overturning the government. But the police tried to disperse the demonstrators with fire hoses, tear gas, clubs, and finally, and most tragically, with bullets. Subsequent investigation disclosed that several thousand shots were fired by the police. The death of a dear friend, the poignancy of grief, ugly beatings by police, hatred reciprocated by students. All these were a part of the great drama that was played out as the democratic victory slowly emerged. Tear gas bombs were hurled only to be thrown back. Fire engines were taken over by students, together with hundreds of other vehicles. And citizens began to applaud and encourage those who had become fighters for freedom. Occasionally did the students resort to destructive violence, as in the burning of government-controlled newspaper, the headquarters of a government-dominated youth corps, and some of the capital's police boxes. The setting sun of April 19 found Korea's principal cities under martial law. Tanks and marching troops of the army entered Seoul, and newspapers held this as a certain harbinger of government reform and an end of political police control. Then followed the week for the treatment of the wounded, the burial of the heroic dead. The nation poured out its heart in food and comfort to the thousands of students in crowded hospitals. Among visitors to the wounded was Dr. Shingman Rhee, then still president, his eyes filled with tears. <laughs> Joint funeral ceremonies were attended by the nation's leaders, among them the anti-government vice president, Dr. Chang Myung, who resigned even before Dr. Rhee. Chang Myung solemnly burned incense in tribute to the gallant dead. Unfortunately, the government learned its lesson too slowly, Compromise was offered instead of the sweeping reforms demanded. 
On the night of April 25th and the morning of the 26th, the students rose again in righteous, insistent anger. Blood was to flow again. The army did not join the demonstrators, but neither did it suppress them, as the police had tried to do. The government finally realized that the choice was resignation or a national bloodbath. Shing Man Rhee offered his resignation. Once announced by an officer of the army, the news spread through the capital and across the countryside. The anger of the demonstrations turned into the rejoicing of victory. Newspapers headlined the overthrow of the Shing Man Rhee regime after 12 years of power. Seoul and the nation celebrated, but quietly, in remembrance of those who had given their lives. Change came fast after that. Students joined to clean up in the wake of the demonstrations. General MacArthur's statue was decorated, not desecrated, as had been falsely reported abroad. With police far and few between, students directed traffic and helped with other aspects of law enforcement. Shing Man Ri, an ordinary citizen again, left the presidential residence at Kyung Mude for his private residence at I Hua Jiang, which means in Korean, Pear Blossom House. By sign and word, the crowd told grandfather as 85-year-old Dr. Rhee is known to the Korean people, to live out his remaining days in peace and quiet. The spotlight shifted to the House of Representatives with a new speaker, Democrat Park sung Hoon. The legislature shaped up a constitutional amendment establishing a cabinet system and prepared other reform legislation affecting civil rights neutralization of the police, local autonomy, honest elections, national security, and other essential measures. The government was temporarily in the hands of a caretaker cabinet headed by Ho Chang, foreign minister and acting president. This interim government will last only about three months, but it has important tasks, including the apprehension and punishment of serious offenders among those who held office in the previous government or who conspired in the illegal activities of the majority Liberal Party. In the capital city of Seoul and other cities, the public showed great generosity in contributions to aid the wounded. The students themselves drifted back to their studies and life slowly returned to normal. Yet life in Korea will never be the same. Those who have risen once can rise a second time or even a third, and they know it. The future is for no man to see, but the students of Korea can see ahead perhaps further than most. They have shaped their own tomorrow as no young people have ever done before.